Okay, so we're going to start again about Yom Kippur. And we start, like I said, we start with the with the essay. I'll open up the essay. We have it in English. And we could um, think about it. But remember, we keep this in mind because we'll need this information in six months when it comes to Yom Kippur. No, I'm only half kidding. But then we'll review it again. Okay. Okay, here we go. The journey begins. The Talmud describes a difference of opinion regarding God's pardoning of our sins on Yom Kippur. There's a dispute. Um, what is the dispute? The dispute is as follows. The sages maintain that Yom Kippur atones only for those who repent. While Rebbe, Rebbe is Rabbi Yehuda the Prince, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, Rabbi the Prince, the author of the Mishnah, we refer to him as Rebbe because he was a great, you know, the great rabbi. You don't even say his name. You say rabbi. You mean Rabbi Yehuda the Prince, the author of the Mishnah. Rebbe says, whether or not one repents, Yom Kippur atones. He explains for the about the tone. This is an interesting argument. The argument is, forget, okay, we know we already limited the scope. We said the sins, this verse applies to, to, to the sins between man and God. Sins between man and, and another person, I have to ask the other person for forgiveness. Okay, so, but, but let's say, so we already limited it that way. But now the mitzvah is between me and God. Do I have to repent? Do I have to apologize? Do I have to do, say the confession or whatever, whatever repentance means? Do I have to do anything or is it automatic? Yom Kippur shows up, and in the language we just quoted, Yitzumai, the essence of the day, atones. I don't have to do anything. So that's a, that's a dispute. The sages say, no, Yom Kippur atones for those who return. They say repent, but we know repent is really return. So I'm, I may say repent, but I mean return. Yom Kippur atones for those who, who return. So in other words, it's not a magic pill. It's not like Yom Kippur comes, everything is, is, is forgiven. I have to do atonement. There's a, the Rebbe says, he says, no, he says, you don't have to, you don't have to re, uh, um, repent. The moment the person, Yom Kippur comes about, the essence of the day itself um, already, already provides atonement. Now, the second opinion is actually more interesting. Number one, because I don't have to do a lot of work. Uh, but number two, because then I say, oh, if it's the re re repentance that forgives, that makes sense. Repenting means I'm changing, I'm transforming. That makes sense why, why um, I would be forgiven for repentance. But if I say repentance is not necessary, it's all the essence of the day, then that says, wow, Yom Kippur has a powerful effect. What is the effect of Yom Kippur? Now, the bad news, of course, is that in Judaism, we follow the majority. So the final line of this, 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 this paragraph is the halacha, the law, the ruling is decided, in according, uh, decided according to our sages. In other words, the law, the law follows the sages. What do the sages say? Yom Kippur only atones for those who repent. You have to do teshuva. Sorry for disappointing. Nevertheless, what the Rebbe is going to do here, the Rebbe is going to say, according to Rebbe, who says the essence of the day atones, we want to understand how does the essence of the day atone. But what the Rebbe is going to do in the next few paragraphs is going to say, even the sages who say, Yom Kippur atones for those who repent, even according to them, the essence of the day atones. Because if it wasn't about the essence of the day, if it wasn't about Yom Kippur, I could do repentance any day. I could do repentance on a Tuesday afternoon. It doesn't have to be Yom Kippur. So what we're saying here is, even according to the sages, Yom Kippur atones, the essence of Yom Kippur atones. The only question is, according to the sage, the only question is, whether or not I have to do anything to tap into the essence of the day, right? So according to Rebbe, you don't have to do anything to tap into the essence of the day. According to the sages, if you want to get the atonement that comes from the essence of the day, you have to repent to tap into the essence of the day. But once you repent, it's not the repentance is atoning, because if the repentance atoned, you don't have to do it once a year. You could do it every day of the year. You always have a responsibility to repent. And the language of this Talmud is, the sages say, Yom Kippur atones for those who repent. So think about that language. Yom Kippur only atones for those who repent. So what does the re what, what atone? What's the atonement? The repentance or Yom Kippur? Yom Kippur atones. 
Yom Kippur atones for those who repent. In other words, when you read this, this statement superficially, it sounds like the disagreement is whether or not the essence of the day atones. Rabbi, who this, Rabbi says yes, sages say no, we follow the sages because the sages say you have to repent. So they can't rely on the essence of the day. But when you read this disagreement upon careful analysis, you see no. They both agree that the essence of the day atones. The question is, how do I tap into the essence of the day? Now, what are we doing here? All we're doing too is, so we're trying to say that that concept is universal, even according to the halacha. And then we have to figure out what's the essence of the day and how does the essence of the day atone? How does the essence of the day atone if I did nothing? But even if I did, did, did teshuva, I tap into the essence of the day, but what is the essence of the day and why does the essence of the day atone? So that's what we're gonna do in the next couple of paragraphs. To clarify, and like I said, the Rebbe is saying he's clarifying, but this is a big idea. In other words, conventionally, you wouldn't read it this way, but the Rebbe is giving us some insight here. To clarify, the sages do not differ with Rebbe. They do not see the essence of a day as lacking the power to bring about atonement in its own right and requiring tshuva, which is return, repentance, to achieve that purpose. They too maintain that it is the essence of the day that atones. For a person cannot reach the level of atonement attained by virtue of the essence of the day with teshuva alone. In other words, if the sages say, if the, you believe, if, 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 if as you read the conventional interpretation, is that the sages say, Yom Kippur doesn't atone, teshuva atones, then they could do teshuva all year. No, teshuva all year will not get you to what teshuva, return and repentance will get you on Yom Kippur. Because teshuva on Yom Kippur, repentance on Yom Kippur is far, far greater than repentance alone. The only difference is the difference between the opinions of Rebbe and our sages is how is it possible for a person to attain the atonement brought about by the essence of the day? In other words, yes, the Yom Kippur has power to, 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 to atone. The question is, how do, I, how do I trigger that? How do I achieve that? Rebbe maintains that when Yom Kippur comes, the power of the essence of the day shines so intensely that even if a Jew does not repent, his sins are wiped away. Our sages, by contrast, ma maintain that for the atonement brought about by the essence of the day to be effective, it must be accompanied by teshuva. Nevertheless, for the atonement brought about by the essence of the day is far loftier and more encompassing than that brought about by teshuva. Thus, both opinions agree that the essence of the day brings about atonement. In other words, what we just did here, we just did a trick. In other words, it's the conventional interpretation. You don't see this this way. Like I said, the conventional interpretation argues, sounds like Rabbi Yossi says the essence of a day um, atones. The sages say Yom Kippur only atones for those who repent. It doesn't use the term. They don't use the term the essence of a day atones. But based on the analysis that we just offered, the Rebbe says, no, even the sages agree that the essence of a day atones. The only question is, how do I get to that? Do I get to the essence of a day just by virtue of the sun setting and Yom Kippur enters? Or do I have to return, repent, return to tap into the energy of the day? But the, but, but the reality is, the, according to both opinions, the essence of the day brings about atonement. And now the question is, what does that mean? What's the essence of Yom Kippur? How does it bring about atonement? Okay, now we, now, but now, now we have, our, now we have the, 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 uh, our agenda laid out for ourselves. So I hope this is clear so far. If I don't have any questions, I assume we're clear. So uh, don't be shy. Okay, now we have a nuance that we have to deal with. Rabbi, can yeah. I just ask? Yeah. So if the essence of the day is atonement, why do I have to repent? So, so that's the question. So, that, so Rebbe says, you don't have to. The sages say, you have to repent. So the conventional interpretation is, you have to repent because Yom Kippur can't do the trick. The Rebbe is saying, no, Yom Kippur does something. What it is, that we'll clarify later. Yom Kippur is far greater than repentance. Yom Kippur has the power to bring about repentance, bring about, bring about atonement, forgiveness. The question is, could I, could I, how do I trigger that? How do I awaken that? How do I tap into that opportunity? In other words, Yom Kippur, almost according to the sages, I would answer your question in short, that Yom Kippur is a certain potential that's out there. 
The question is, how do I um, bring that potential into actuality? How do I harness it? How do I make it part of me? And for that, I have to tune in. So let me give you an example, a simple example, right? You have the radio. What's the radio? There are radio waves that are present, right? But if you don't have a machine that will help you tune in to the right channel, you're going to miss it. You're not going to be able to hear what's going on. TV is the same thing before the internet, right? So it's all there, right? The, the wave, waves are out there. So Yom Kippur is beaming. Yom Kippur is available for anybody who's willing to take out their machine and align with the energy of Yom Kippur, right? Mm -hmm. Move the dial. You probably, I, I, my, my, my grandmother had that the radio where you actually move the, the, the dial to get to the right, to get to the right uh, channel. I don't think they do that anymore. But in any case, you got to align. You got to align with that energy. And how do you align? That's repentance. But once you align, it's not that because you move the dial, that's what creates the noises. No, the noises have been out there before you, right? The noises are in the air. There's radio waves and TV waves taking place all over the place. My job is just to tune in. So I go to Shul, I, I, I repent, I do all kinds of things to tune in. But it's not that the repentance is creating that energy. That energy, energy is out there. Question is, do I, have to, do I have to tune into it? Rebbe says it's so powerful, you don't have to tune into it. Sages say you have to do work to tune into it. But once you do the work, it's not that you are creating it. It's being created um, by the essence of the day. So the essence of the day is what it tells us. Oh, back, back to our question, what's the essence of the day and how does it atone? Thank you. Now I'm completely confused. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's a joke. <laughs> I hope that was a joke. I really do. It was, it was. Okay, good. <laughs> but that you need to go back to the written Torah because it says clearly that Hashem will provide atonement for you. You don't even need the Rebbe to say that. But on Yom Kippur. On Yom Kippur. Right. On, the, right. on Yom Kippur. So you're right. That, you're right. You're right that that's what the, that's what the verse is saying. But I'm just saying when you, if I just read the Talmud by itself and I didn't take the time to analyze it the way that I was analyzing it, I would miss this nuance because that's quote. You know, the essence of the day atones is in the mouth of Rebbe. The sages don't say that quote, but I like you say they have to mean that. If they don't mean that. What's the verse saying? And not only what the verse is saying, what is the, what are the sages themselves saying? They're saying Yom Kippur atones for those who repent. If the repentance does the atonement, then why do you need Yom Kippur? I could do it any day. And in fact, the mitzvah to repent is independent of the mitzvah of Yom Kippur. If I sinned, I have um, if 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 I if I, if I sinned, I have a responsibility to repent any time, right? So so there's repentance through there's the repentance there's the atonement through repentance and there's the atonement through Yom Kippur. Okay. Now before we get to one before we get to the uh, before we get to the explanation, the Rebbe inserts another nuance, a very interesting nuance. We know that there's 10 days of repentance, right? I'm sure people heard about the 10 days of repentance. Teshuva, 10 days of repentance. What are the 10 days of repentance? From Rosh Hashanah, which is the first of the month, to Yom Kippur, which is the 10th day of the month, is called the 10 days of repentance. Aseretime Teshuva. And that's why we add all kinds of things in the prayer. And it's a time for repentance. Okay. The problem with the statement, the 10 days of repentance, is that if you look at the source of where the sages coined that term, they don't really say the 10 days of repentance. What they say, it was sort of, that, that became a phrase based on the original phrase. What was the original phrase? The original phrase is the 10 days that are between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Anybody have any questions on that statement? The Talmud says the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is the season for repentance. 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. The problem with that statement is if you take out your calculator, how many days are between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur? Only seven. Because Rosh Hashanah is day one and two. Yom Kippur is day three. So the days between um, Yom Kippur is, is day 10. So between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, you have seven days. So what, the, what happened to the sages? They missed the math class. They count 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Now, if they wanted to say 10 days, and if they meant between, meaning including, which is a possibility, so just say, don't say between. Say the 10 days that, that commence with Rosh Hashanah and conclude with Yom Kippur. What's Shebein? Okay, so this is a problem. I, I haven't seen anyone addressing this, but this is a problem. So what are the, what's the Rebbe going to do in the next paragraph? The is going to say, that's the nuance that the sages are alluding to. 
in the 10 days, okay, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur have two aspects. One aspect of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is you do teshuva, repentance. That aspect exists on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and on the intermediate and, and on the seven days that in between. So from the perspective of teshuva, there is 10 days. Nevertheless, the sages express themselves in a term that says that between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, which could imply that Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are not included in the 10 days. So are they included in the 10 days? Or are they not included in the 10 days? What we're trying to allude to is as follows. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur have an aspect in which they are included in the 10 days. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur have the aspect of repentance. On Rosh Hashanah, we repent, and on Yom Kippur, we repent. And on the seven days in between, we repent, and we repent all the time. But Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are actually not included in the 10 days in some ways. And that's why we say between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. This alludes to the fact that Rosh Hashanah and, and Yom Kippur, for our discussion, it's Yom Kippur, but, but, but Rosh Hashanah also, they have the core, the essence of the day. And the essence of the day is not repentance. And therefore, they have their own theme. So they're not part of the seven days that are between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. In other words, what they're ever saying, so we shouldn't be confused, what they're ever saying is, this statement was written in a confusing way to allude to the fact that these Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are, have, have a, double, a double, double aspect. On one hand, they're part of a day, 10 days of repentance because Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are also part of repentance, part of the theme of the day's repentance. Nevertheless, they're also separate from the days in between because they have the core of the day and the core of the day is not repentance. The core of the day is something deeper, which we're about to get to. So this was a nuance. I'll read it inside quickly. If it was confusing, you could skip it. Don't worry. On this basis, we can also understand our sages interpretation of the verse, seek God when he is to be found. There's a verse in, 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 in Isaiah, seek God when he is found. Literally, Behimatzai, seek, seek God when he is present. The ver, Isaiah says, seek God when he is present. So the Talmud says, one second, when is God present? Isn't God everywhere all the time? So the sages say, yeah, but there are sometimes he's more present. When is he more present? These are the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. That's when God is more present. That's when we should seek God, right? So the sages explain, these are the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur which is, but we don't even have to ask the question. There are no 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. There are only seven. So what, what does the Rebbe explain? On one hand, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are included in the sum of these 10 days. Without them, there would not be the 10 days of Teshuva. Simultaneously, the fundamental dimension of both Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is not that they are days of Teshuva. Indeed, the days of Teshuva are described as being between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. The dimensions of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur that, that, we, that are included in, this, in the days of Teshuvah are the lower dimensions of these days. The fundamental aspect of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur transcends the divine service of Teshuvah. The fundamental aspect of Rosh Hashanah is the crowning of God as a king, but we're not going to get into that. The fundamental aspect of Yom Kippur is atonement brought about by the essence of the day. An endowment granted every Jew from above that is not measured according to his service of Teshuvah. This is what we're trying to get at. Which what we're trying to get at is to explain that Teshuvah, even according to the sages, that, that said you have to do Teshuvah on Yom Kippur to tap in to the essence of the day. But the essence of the day is not Teshuvah. Teshuvah is one aspect of the day that the day shares with the other seven days in between. But the Torah says Teshuvah is essentially between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur to highlight that Rosh Hashanah and Kippur themselves have their own theme. Rosh Hashanah, we're not going to get into. We'll wait for six months from now. Yom Kippur, the essence of the day is that the essence of the day atones. Now that leads to the question, how does the essence of the day atone? Okay, we're back to square one. That's an underlying question. That's, that, that's really what we want to get to. That's really what we gathered here today. Okay, so the next paragraph, the next few paragraphs, what we're going to do is going to highlight this question. We're going to say, what does this even mean that atonement can happen by itself because of a day? Atonement means I change. 
I am purified. Not only I'm not punished, right? The conventional wisdom is I sin, so God will punish me. So I say, God, I'm sorry, and God doesn't punish me. That's not atonement. Atonement in Hebrew, the word kapara means purification. Lechaper is to purify. I'm no longer, I don't, I no longer have that negativity within me. So if I repent, I'm, I change, I regret the past, I resolve for the future. Now I understand how I can be purified. But how could I be purified just by the virtue of the day? That's very difficult to understand. So we're going to elaborate on the question in the, se- in the next few paragraphs, and then we'll get to the answer. So again, this is the elaboration of the question. Here we go. Atonement means more than withholding punishment for a person's sins. The implication is, the implication of atonement is, that all blemishes and taints brought about by sin are wiped away from the person's soul. And in a consummate sense, atonement not only atonements, atonements not only that no trace of sin remains, but that the sin itself is transformed and becomes considered a merit. So we're not going to get into that, but we know the sages say that if a person does proper for uh, um, uh, atonement, truth atonement, is that the sin not only is the sin wiped away or the negativity of the sin wiped away, but the sin itself is transformed into a merit. Explanation is necessary. We can understand how this dynamic operates when the Jew repents and feels remorse for the sins he has committed. His regret eradicates the pleasure he experienced at the time of sin, and this purifies and washes away the traces of evil of his soul. Right? We know that, that, uh, that sin, that teshuva, repentance, has two important components, two essential components. One is resolving for the future, and one is regret for the past. Why is regret for the past so, so, so important? God needs us to feel guilty? Why is regret of the past so critical? So the answer is that if you're talking about to transform the person himself, so when I sin, I invest my pleasure in the sin. Regret is the opposite. It means if I regret that that makes me feel bad, it means I'm pulling out my pleasure from that event and I'm investing it elsewhere. So that's internal transformation. So we understand how atonement, cleansing, can happen through a person's repentance. But the question becomes, the question becomes, but when atonement is brought about by the essence of a day without the person's teshuva, and like we said, even according to the sages, teshuva, all the teshuva does is triggers the essence of a day. But once the essence of a day is triggered, the essence of a day atones, not the teshuva. Right. So, but when atonement is brought about by the essence of the day without the person's teshuva, how can it result in such a process of inner purification? It is possible to understand that the person will be absolved and not subjected to punishment because such atonement was granted. But how can he have the blemishes to the soul that sin creates be purified? In other words, without me doing anything, how could you say that the essence of the day has the power? to change me internally, to cleanse my soul. And like we said, this question applies even according to our sages, who maintain that tshuva is required. For as explained earlier, they also agree that the atonement of Yom Kippur has a more encompassing effect in the divine service of tshuva. Surely this question applies according to the Rebbe, who maintains that Yom Kippur brings about atonement even without tshuva. So this is the question, and now we're getting to the core, now we're getting to the answer. So we have to read at least one more chapter, and then we can figure out how many, how many more details we want to get into. Okay, so far, so good. Everybody is clear. We understand the question. If you tell me repentance, I understand how repentance works. Okay, let's start, let's start with atonement means. The conventional interpretation means atonement means you're forgiven. God will not punish you. If that's the, if that's the definition, we have no questions. God could say, on Yom Kippur, I'm being benevolent. I'm forgiving everybody. I'm not gonna, he's not going to bill us for our sins. Okay, you want to forgive the debt, forgive the debt. But we know that atonement means much more than that. In Hebrew, kapara doesn't mean he's not going to punish. Kapara means purification. Purification means inner transformation, meaning my soul is no longer affected by the negativity of sin. Now, so I understand how that can happen through repentance because I regret, I resolve for the future. I'm a changed person, okay? But how could all this inner transformation and purification happen as a result of just the essence of the day. How does that affect inner change? This, ladies and gentlemen, is the essence, is the question, which is really just a way 
to, to, to peel the layers and get to what exactly is Yom Kippur. Okay, so before we read it inside, I'm going to give a little summary of the answer, at least as far as I remember it. And it may be a little bit off, but you'll see, you'll be able to see when you read it inside. And what we're going to say is like this, the uh, relationship with God is multi-layered. And just like human relationships are multi-layered. You have a relationship, a conventional relationship that is conditional, right? Um, the employer hires the employee. Why? Because the employee produces. The, the, the teacher spends time with the student. Why? Because the student is listening and paying attention. If the student doesn't pay attention, you throw him out of the house. So there's conventional relationships. I'm your friend. Why am I your friend? Because I get something in return. I spend time with you. I get, give you something, but I get something in return. That's most, most, most relationships are are most conventional relationships are basically conditional. And therefore, if I was your friend and all of a sudden you stop, you stop treating me badly, I'm no longer your friend, good's conditional. Then there's a different category in the relationship. A different category of the relationship is unconditional relationships. Unconditional relationships is no matter what happens, we're still connected. That's a parent-child relationship. You can divorce your friend, you can divorce your spouse, you can't divorce a child, you cannot talk to a child, that's fine. But the essential connection is always there. Now, all year, we focus on our relationship with God, and we focus on the, the conventional aspect of the relationship, on the conditional aspect. We say, God, we're, we want to we wanna do the right thing. And we want you to appreciate us for what we're doing, for the right thing that we're doing conditional. What is the sin? The sin is I sin against God. What is repentance? Transform myself. Come back. Tell, tell God we can go back to our conditional relationship. I can do, I, I, I'm here. I'm willing to take responsibility for what I did. I'm willing to continue doing good. That's all fine and good. So both the commandments that we fulfill all year and the repentance that corrects the, the sins that we committed all year, are all fall into the category of conventional relationship. And by the way, with your children, you also have convention. Your, your children, you have double aspect. Within your child, yourself, you also have the conventional aspect. But we'll get to that later. I give you allowance when you make your bed. If you don't make your bed, you don't get allowance. Conditional. Okay. And if you didn't make your bed and you and you hurt me and you apologize, okay, that's repentance. Now you're transformed. Now we can go back to our conditional relationship. Okay. Yom Kippur is a different concept. Yom Kippur is not about repentance. Yom Kippur is about the unconditional relationship between God and the Jewish people, which is like a parent to a child. We really doesn't matter what the child does. You still have a connection to the child. Okay. So William Kippur comes about and Yom Kippur says, we're going to create the atonement. How are we going to create the atonement? Because on Yom Kippur, I can tap in to my core. And at my core of my soul, it doesn't matter what I did consciously or subconsciously, at the core of my soul, the core of my soul has an un uh, unconditional connection to God, and God has an unconditional connection to the core of my soul. So Yom Kippur is the day where I can tap into that place within me that has an unconditional connection to God. And that's the essence of a day that provides atonement. And that's how the atonement provides, because I discover that the parts of me that are negative are external, that's not really my essence. My essence is pure. If my essence is pure, my essence is co always completely bound with God, then that will ultimately impact um, my, my conscious. But the reality is it doesn't matter if it does or if it doesn't. The reality is if I tap into the place and I discover that my core is one with God, then all the sins are meaningless. Because when you have the unconditional bond and the unconditional bond is revealed, then everything else really doesn't matter if that unconditional bond is felt. Now the question is, how does the unconditional bond, how is the unconditional bond felt? Rabbi Yossi says, you don't have to do anything. I'm your child, you're my parents. You have to embrace me the way I am. The essence of a day, which in other words means unconditional love, should forgive, a, for, forgive alone. Sages so say, no, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. 
Of course, there's the essence. Of, of course, there's the essence of a day. Of course, there's an unconditional love. That unconditional love is going to be there. But you want to tap into that, you have to be a mensch. You have to do teshuva. You have to try to improve yourself, not because the improving of yourself is going to put us in the, is going to correct our conventional relationship, our conditional relationship. No, but you have to repent. You have to get your house in order. You have to improve your conditional relationship so that you have to call your mom and say, I'm sorry, not so you can go back to a conditional relationship so that you can express the unconditional relationship. But when you say you're sorry, what is creating the atonement? Not in the conditional relationship, the unconditional relationship. Here we have it. Now we know what the essence of a day work is. Now we know how it atones. Now we know the difference between Rabbi, Rabbi and the sages. Now, this is my summary. You want to hear, don't want to hear from me. You want to hear it from the words of the Rebbe. So we'll jump right in. Unless anybody has any question, we'll jump right in. We'll read the next chapter, next few paragraphs, and then we'll call it a day. We'll take questions. We'll call it a day. We don't want to get further. Further goes back to you to see how that point reflects is reflected in Rosh Hashanah, but that's not for right now. The above question can be resolved by understanding the various levels of connection that the Jew shares with God. In other words, the various connection, the various levels of the relationship between a Jew and God. A, a bond that is established through the Jews' observance of God's commandments and the acceptance of the yoke of heaven, committing themselves to do whatever God commands. My language, I said this was conditional. You do what God wants, God has a relationship with you. B, second one, like a bond that exists between a father and a child. There is an inner bond that connects the Jew to God that is loftier and deeper than the connection established by fulfilling the commandments and accepting the yoke of his sovereignty. In other words, there's a deeper connection than I have a relationship with God because I do what God wants. The inner connection is expressed by the fact that even a Jew who has violated God's commandments and cast off the yoke of heaven will feel the stress and remorse as a result. Ultimately, these feelings will motivate him to turn to God in Teshuvah. Because Teshuvah comes from a deeper level of a connection within the soul than that, than that established through the observance of mitzvot, it has the power to break through the barriers and remove the spiritual blemishes that sin causes. Sin weakens the soul's revealed bond with God. Teshuvah reveals an inner connection that enables a bond with God to be established. Nevertheless, even the inner connection has a certain limit that is measured in the person's expression of teshuva. In other words, I said there are two levels, there are really three, but the first two are related. The first two are, convention, are, are conditional. First level is I'm, related to, uh, I'm, I'm connected to God because I do what God's will. Second level is the deeper connection. Even when I violate God's will, I feel bad and I do teshuva and I reestablish that connection. But even that connection, how deep is that connection based on how deep my teshuva is? So in other words, it's conditional. Then we get to the third level. What's the third level? An essential bond that unites the essence of the soul and God's essence. This bond knows no measure or limits whatsoever and is too lofty to be manifest through any mode of expression, even teshuva. In other words, this is a bond. My soul, I, my soul is part of God. So my soul, the core of my soul is connected to the essence of God. It's independent of what I do or how I do it. It can't be measured by doing a mitzvah or by repentance for failing to do a mitzvah. This level of connection cannot be established through our activities in divine service. For all mortal activities, however lofty, have a certain limit, right? If I could create, you see, if the, if the bound, if the, if the connection is, is, is achieved through my actions, then it's limited because my actions are limited. And if you say this is, uncondi this is un unconditional, on my actions, then my actions can't create it and my actions can destroy, cannot destroy it, right? How, um, instead, it is an innate natural connection possessed by every Jew stemming from the essence of his soul, which is an actual part of God from above, a quote from Ch Tanya chapter two. Even while enclosed in the, in the body, the soul clings and cleaves to you. It's oneness affirming your oneness, meaning to say, even when the person sins in, the, in, the, with, with his, in his uh, conscious being, but the essence of the soul is always bound up with God. Since this level of connection transcends all measure and form, just, that can, just as it cannot be established through the divine service, it cannot be weakened or impaired by a lack of service or even by sin. No blemish or sin can affect this level of connection. In other words, 
you have a connect, connect you have a, a level where if my child is not respectful the, the, the conditional connection is blemished but the essential connection wasn't created because my child behaved and therefore the essential connection is not diminished if my child misbehaves doesn't mean i'm going to call them but the point is doesn't mean i'm going to have the, i'm going to express the relationship but at the core the core that, that connection still exists it wasn't created by the action and therefore can't be destroyed by any action No blemish or sin can affect this level of connection. This is why the essence of a day brings about atonement. On Yom Kippur, the essential bond that every Jew shares with God surfaces. When this bond is manifest, all blemishes fall away and, 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 as a matter of course. As mentioned above, the difference between the views of Rebbe and the Sages hinges on whether Teshuvah is necessary to reveal this level. They both agree that it is not Teshuvah which brings about the atonement of Yom Kippur, but rather that atonement stems from the essence of the day. The only question is, how do I reveal, how do I tap into that? Do I just come back to God, my father in heaven and say, you have to accept me unconditionally or no, I have to be a mensch. I have to apologize. I have to correct my ways. When I do, the unconditional level is triggered. And that's what the sages are saying. We'll read two more paragraphs. On this, on the levels of the soul where sins can have an effect and cause a blemish, atonement must be achieved through a person's work. He must actively turn to God in Teshuvah. Doing so brings about a partial movement, a, a, a parallel movement in the spiritual realms, engendering a deeper connection with God that breaks through and removes any obstacles that might prevent such a bond. In other words, when you're talking about the level of the, the, a bond to God that's created by my action, so if I sin, I have to recreate it by Teshuvah, and that elicits from above a higher level of connection. The atonement brought about by Yom Kippur is of a different nature. It results from the revelation of a level within godliness and, is, and the soul where there is no possibility for ble blemish to exist, as explained above. So that's the story in short, a lot more to say, but I think this is very powerful stuff because it tells us about the nature of, the, of, of, of relationships, but also the nature of the connection between people, but also the connection between person and God. And every person has to understand that the connection to God, there is a level of connection, which is, created and therefore dependent on how I act. And then, but my essence of God, my essence of the soul is created, is connected to God, not because of anything I do, it's because of who I am in my essence. And therefore a sin doesn't weaken that connection. Maybe it conceals it, but it doesn't weaken it. And if you can tap into that level of the soul of my core, I'm always, I'm always connected to God in an un, um, un, 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 unconditional way. The only question is, how do I reveal it? And, that, and, that, and that's what we call on Yom Kippur. On Yom Kippur, you have that power to connect to the, your core. And if you connect to your core, then that's the way atonement comes about because you realize that this, everything else that I did is, is, not, is not me. That's just an external layer. It's my garment. It's not me. You know, what the I'm, sure is appropriate to humanity. Yes. Julia, no kid. Yeah, so what's the, what's the idea? The only question is, how, do I have to... Do I have to? Uh, um, do I have to? Um, do I have to tap? Do I have to do teshuva to tap into that core? And if you want to move away from the talk and talk about human relationships, especially with families and people where you're supposed to have an unconditional bond, I'm thinking to myself that even here the sages are giving some advice. Sages are telling you that just because it's a conditional, unconditional bond, it doesn't mean you don't have to work on the conditional connection because sometimes you can't really expect to reach the unconditional connection before you first correct the conditional, con the conditional relationship. And that's the bridge. But once that bridge is built, what's revealed is the essential connection. So that's the story in short. I think this is profound, powerful stuff. Go ahead, Vicky. Thank you, Rabbi. Really beautiful and very useful. Um, I just want to clarify, uh, Rabbi doesn't say anything about the sense between, doesn't differentiate between sense between uh, man and man and man and God. So it apply, applies to both, right? It I doesn't so. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because if you look at the Rebbe's logic, go back to what the sages say. The sages don't, the sages say, Yom Kippur does not atone for the sins against your fellow person until I get forgiveness from my friends. But the same logic. But when I get a, a forgiveness from my friends, it's not my friend's forgiveness. It's Yom Kippur's forgiveness, right? Yom Kippur, Mechaper. Yom Kippur does not forgive unless I get first get forgiveness from my friend. The implication is if I get forgiveness from my friend, 
then the unconditional bond with God is what is revealed. The problem is if I rob the bank and I have all the cash sitting in my counter, I can't reveal that unconditional, that unconditional, that unconditional um, um, connection until I give the money back and, 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 and atone, achieve, achieve atonement by getting forgiveness. But when I do get the forgiveness, what creates it, what creates the forgiveness or the atonement or the cleansing is not the forgiveness that my friend gave me, it's the forgiveness of Yom Kippur, which means where I tap into the fact to my core, the core of my soul, and the core of my soul is unconditionally connected to God. Thank you, thank you. Now this is the story, this is good stuff. Thank you all for joining. This is, uh, a little, oh, I told you I'll give you a connection to Yom Kippur. So the Passover, because right after Passover, Yom Kippur. So I made a quick Google search, Yom Kippur, Pesach, what's going on? Turns out that there's a fascinating Zohar. The Zohar says, doesn't elaborate, but makes a certain connection. The Zohar says like this, Yom Kippur is the 10th of the seventh month. Remember, Judaism has two new years. It's got the seventh month. In other words, we count new years from Rosh Hashanah. We count years from Rosh Hashanah. We count months from, pa from Passover. So it's almost like we have two ways to start the year. Now, the 10th of the seventh month is Yom Kippur. When is Passover? The Passover is the 15th of the first month. So 15 is not 10. What's the connection? But the Zohar says, whoops, there is something that happened on the 10th of the first month. It's actually written explicitly in the Torah. The first year when the Jewish people are in Egypt, God comes to Moses and Aaron on the first of Nisan, and he tells them about the preparations to leave Egypt on the 15th day, 15 days later. And he says, 14 days from now, you're going to take the Paschal offering and create the Paschal lamb, and at night you're going to eat it, and that's to be the night of the Exodus. But when were they commanded to take the, the sheep? The Torah says, God tells Moshe, Ba'asor lachodesh, the 10th day of Nisan, four days before they have to slaughter the animal, they should go and take and get a sheep or a lamb for the Paschal offering. So right away, 10th of Nisan is like the 10th of Tishrei. That's what the Zohar says. Both express great levels of connection. Okay, what does that mean? So here you have a little bit of elaboration from other Hasidic commentaries and say, what is Yom Kippur? Yom Kippur is the essential, the essential bond between God and the Jewish people. That act of taking the sheep in Egypt expressed that same point because it, in some sense, it was an act of self-sacrifice because as we know that the Egyptians served one of their gods, and many gods, one of the gods was the, Tala was the lamb. And for the Jewish people to take the lamb and slaughter it and put the blood on the doorposts and tell everybody that we're preparing uh, a steak or preparing dinner out of your God is an act of great self-sacrifice. So the Hasidic commentators say, what the Zohar is really saying is that that same commitment to God that we feel on Yom Kippur, the unconditional bond was also felt on the 10th of Nisan when the Jewish people acted in self-sacrifice and, and, and took that lamb in defiance of the Egyptians, which was an act of great, great self-sacrifice. So both the Passover has some sense of Jewish people recognizing their unconditional love to God, and therefore they do things that are irrational, like risk their life to fulfill God's commandments. So that may or may not be the only, the only connection, but that's the one I found uh, yesterday morning. So uh, for now, that will suffice. So thank you all for joining. Wonderful day. And we should meet each other in good health. Thank you, Rabbi. Chazak Baruch. Thank you. Thank you, Albert. Thank you for joining. Be well. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Wonderful. Good, Rabbi. I will Have a nice day. Thank no you. Thank you, Zina. Thank you.